And so hopefully we should be able to re record this whole thing and uh, have a record of it afterwards. So uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Uh, and thanks for joining me today for this first webinar I'm doing in 2013. And it's on brilliant offensive strategies and for 2013 and for beyond. So uh, <clears throat> I'm recording the session. You'll have access to a download as soon as I can make it available. And uh, I can also provide a copy of the slides uh, in PDF if you require it or if you request it. And I've got, uh, just for today's attendees, I got a bit of a door prize. Uh, I've got five copies of my book uh, available. And uh, the first people, the first five people complete a, a very short survey at the end of the session um, will be able to uh, will receive a, a free copy of my book. I'll mail you a free copy of my book. So uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'll jump right, jump right into it. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, before we start, I'd just like to explain a bit about who I am and what, what I do. Uh, many of you already know me, but just to bring everybody up to speed, this is the home page of my website, alcera.ca, that's A-L-C-E-R-A dot C-A. And it says right there what it is uh, that I do uh, in a very, very uh, succinct nutshell. I, I help my clients exploit change so that they can grow and uh, uh, achieve uh, radically improved performance. So in terms of the uh, services I offer, we've got uh, comprehensive consulting services that I offer. Uh, I also have a remote advisory service. Uh, I provide leadership and executive coaching, and I provide speaking and facilitation. So what I do is I bring to bear my military and business leadership and management expertise for executives and organizations and entrepreneurs who want to exploit change so that they can grow and maximize performance. So that's what it is that I do. Now, I started, uh, I served for over 25 years in the Canadian Army and I was a, I retired as a senior officer, an infantry officer in 2006. Uh, so I've got a background commanding troops in Bosnia and also working as a senior liaison officer in the Persian Gulf. As a matter of fact, I was there in Kuwait uh, in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq in early 2003. So I, I had been sent there in case Canada would be participating officially in the war. So th those are probably the two highlights, operational highlights of my military career. So um, that just provides a, a bit of a background. I started my company, which is Alcera Consulting Incorporated, back in 2006. And uh, as you can see, that's what I've been doing since then is bringing that military and business leadership expertise to bear. So I, I help my public and private sector clients implement strategy, craft strategy, uh, implement change initiatives, and also to develop outstanding leadership capabilities. So please feel free to go to my website uh, at any point. There are literally hundreds of articles there. Uh, all of my newsletters have been uh, archived since I started writing them in early 2007. Comes out once a month. I never miss it. And I also have a weekly, very, very short month, Monday morning, uh, brilliant maneuvers uh, newsletter that goes out to uh, my lists also. And you can register for either one of those uh, through my website. And I'd also point out up here, there's a button to my blog, which is called exploitingchange.com. And I've got a lot of information on that blog also. So here's the game plan that I want to cover today. And uh, I just point out that if you have any questions at any time, use the question facility and uh, just type it in. And I will try to, um, I will either incorporate it into my presentation or answer it directly on the spot. So that's basically the, um, the approach that we're going to take for uh, the interaction. So the first thing is I'd like to talk about is offense, what it is and why we need it. So what is offensive strategy? What's offensive action? What is it and why do we need it? Then we'll look at a way of, of assessing your offensive capacity and that of your competitors. And I'm focusing on the competitive landscape 
from a business perspective, but obviously we could do this from any number of perspectives. And we'll talk a bit about that in a couple of minutes. Then we're going to look at how to maneuver and exploit your competitors' weaknesses so that you can create breakthroughs. And that could be products, it could be innovation, it could be new business models, it could be just about anything. But we're going to focus once again on the competitive landscape. Then we're going to look at the path of least resistance, which is the second aspect of offensive ability or offensive strategy. And that's very critical. And it's also very, uh, very fundamental to how you can achieve just about whatever you want to achieve in life and in business. And then finally, we'll, we'll look at how you can create a culture of offensive action, an offensive mindset in your organization. So I'd like to start by offense, what it is and why we need it. Before I do that, I'd just like to, to tell a little story. Um, it's the story of, of what I call the, the tale of two Chamberlains. Uh, those of you who know a bit about military history might have heard about uh, Neville Chamberlain, who was the British Prime Minister in the 1930s up to May 1940, as a matter of fact. And he's, uh, he famously uh, negotiated with Hitler in 1938 and 1939. And in the spring of 1939, he came back uh, from uh, Munich, having negotiated uh, the takeover of Czechoslovakia by Nazi Germany. And when he got off the plane, he, he quite brazenly announced, I bring you peace in our time. So that's Neville Chamberlain. And basically what he did was he took a very, very defensive posture uh, towards Nazi Germany. And really nobody in France and in the other Western countries, such as Britain, wanted to fight the Nazis. So they let they gave the initiative to the Nazis. The other Chamberlain is Joshua Chamberlain, who was a colonel during the uh, American Civil War. And the thing about Josh, Joshua Chamberlain, he was a civilian. He had been a, uh, he was a reservist, and he commanded uh, the 20th Maine Regiment at the Battle of Gettysburg. And on the first day of the battle, his regiment was completely surrounded, and they were holding down the left side of the uh, Union line. So the northern uh, line was held, the, the left part of that line was anchored by the 20th Maine Regiment, but they had come under attack all day. They were down to the, their last rounds of ammunition. As a matter of fact, many of the riflemen didn't even have ammunition at the end of the day. And as the Confederates were preparing for a final assault on the 20th Maine Regiment's position, what did Joshua Chamberlain do? he ordered charge. And the regiment charged downhill, uh, rounded up the Confederates, and they were so surprised that they, they couldn't fight back. So they captured an entire Confederate regiment. And it was because of that offensive action in the midst of hardship and in the midst of the Confederate attack, the fact that they he went on the offensive, he went on the charge, he was able to reseize the initiative and save the left part of the Union line. So that's really what offense is all about. And you have to ask yourself in business or, or many other areas, what if you're down to your last $1,000? Uh, do you hunker down? Do you buy macaroni and cheese so you can survive a few more weeks before closing shop? Or do you sell the conference table so that you can use the funds for something else? Or do you use your limited resources to launch a marketing initiative or to go and visit your highest potential prospect? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about an offense, and it's contrasted with defense. So what is offense, really? In the simplest, the simplest expression is that it's about seizing and maintaining the initiative so that you can attack the competition at the time and place of your choosing so that you can gain and exploit freedom of action. And I'll be explaining these terms in a second. What is defense? It's only a means to buy time when you've lost the initiative or temporarily to protect gains. And of course, uh, a great military strategist and historian, Carl von Clausewitz, he said the best form of defense is attack. So the common understanding is offense. It's all about attacking and taking an aggressive stance, but it's much more about that. It's centered on seizing and maintaining the initiative. If you've lost the initiative or given it up intentionally or unintentionally, whether you like it or not, you're in a defensive posture. You can still maintain an offensive mindset 
even if you're in a temporarily defensive posture due to circumstances. This is what Joshua Chamberlain did at the Battle of Gettysburg. They were in a defensive posture, but he maintained uh, an offensive mindset, and that's what allowed him to launch that charge. Just, just think of a sports team. We've all seen the phenomenon of a sports team trying to protect the lead rather than being aggressive, even if they're still in the lead. Uh, if you're trying to avoid losing, trying to protect the lead, eventually you open yourself to the risk of being overtaken. So if, even if you're way ahead, you have to keep your offensive my, mindset to stay in the lead. So I'm going to use a lot of uh, tech company examples today. And the reason for that is because technology companies evolve so fast. Technology evolves fast. It's almost like seeing a scientific experiment in, in action. So, and, and the differences are very stark and we all know about these companies. I'll use some other examples, but I'll be focusing a lot on that area. So Research in Motion, it's a company that's been in a defensive posture for a number of years. And what started the company turning around was when the top leadership realized they had lost the initiative and they started work on regaining it. And we're starting to see some of the benefits of, now, of that now, some of the effects. For instance, in research, uh, Research in Motion is preparing to launch the BlackBerry 10 on the 30th of January, and it's having an effect on the stock price. Now, whether they'll be successful or not, I don't know. But they're regaining the initiative or they're fighting to regain the initiative. So that's very significant. The next point I'd like to make about offense is it's an overall effort. You can be on the offensive overall or in some areas while you're in the defensive in other areas. So here we see, here's your main effort could be offensive and you could have another effort that's on the offensive and a secondary effort that's on the defense. Let's think once again of research in motion. It's been on the defensive in North America for a number of years. But it's remained on the offensive in Latin America and Asia, and particularly in Southeast Asia. And for instance, in Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries, research in motion is the market leader. So that's very important to realize that you can have a variety. Uh, it doesn't have to be everybody across the board that's on the offensive. And as a matter of fact, some of your businesses have to be more on the defensive, taking less risk in order to free up resources to go on the offensive elsewhere. Think of Microsoft that's pretty much on the defensive with its office and uh, productivity suites, but that allows it to generate cash to invest in offensive initiatives in other areas of the business. Another example, uh, General Motors, they've been on the defensive for years in North America, but they're on the offensive in China and other Asian countries. As a matter of fact, I was reading uh, last year, Buick is one of the top foreign brands in, uh, in China. So that might be surprising to us, but in Asia and in China, GM is on the offensive. Think of the Catholic Church. They've been on the defensive for decades in Western Europe and in North America, but in many other parts of the world, Latin America, Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, the Catholic Church has been on the offensive. And we could even say that for Christian religions and sects in general. So we can see this applies to many areas and fields of endeavor. Now, why we need offense, there's something in, in military strategy that you've probably heard this expression. It's called the fog of war. And what does it consist of? Well, you've got friction. In other words, friction is Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Uncertainty. Uncertainty is, is something that you don't know because you don't know all the facts and it's irreducible uncertainty. No matter what you do, you can't gain sufficient certainty to overcome that. Ignorance. It's basically, it's what you don't know, but you can take certain measures to find out. And then finally, you've got your opponent or your competitor, or if you're talking about military strategy, of course, your, your enemy. And like, like they say in the military, the enemy gets a vote. You can have the most brilliant strategy uh, possible, but if your enemy or if your competitor or if your opponent has their own strategy, they're going to be reacting and they're going to be acting. So that's probably the biggest factor. Those are the four biggest factors that 
create what's known as the fog of war. And the same thing happens uh, economically in business. So we can have a recession. There's the fiscal cliff in the United States, which has only been put off by a couple of months. Uh, technological change, demographic shifts, rising economic and political uh, geopolitical players. Uh, everybody talks about the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Now there are countries, there's a, another acronym, I forget what it is, but uh, there's Turkey in there, there's Indonesia, there's Vietnam. These are all rising economic powers. They have an impact economically and geopolitically. We've got chaotic markets, certainly financial markets, but many other markets are chaotic also. Competitive pressures, changing tastes and mores. Uh, one of the things that's happening more and more is change, um, tastes change quickly but they're also more ephemeral. It's almost as if fashion has extended to all domains. Uh, certainly, we even see that, it, for instance, in uh, business trends, uh, management trends. Uh, there are fashions that come and go. There are trends that come and go. They come quickly, and then they disappear quickly. The falling costs of information and the fact that most common knowledge is readily available and can't be charged for anymore. Uh, you've got Wikipedia, blogs. Uh, for instance, I have a client they, uh, that works in the field of, they're in the field of event management and destination management. So one of their products or services is incentive programs, helping their clients organize incentive programs. One of the things that's happened with the internet and the availability of information over the last couple of years is that before uh, clients had to go through a destination management company and an event manager in the location they were going to be visiting in order to be able to know what, what's happening. What are the best hotels? What are the best activities for their, for their people? Nowadays, they can get all this for free on the internet. So that leads to a commodification of the information and the, uh, the service that used to be offered by these types of companies, and certainly my client, has to move upstream, has to become more valuable so that their clients are willing to pay for that information. And finally, we've got the law of entropy. What is the law of entropy? Well, that just says that if you don't move, things wear out. So you have to continually be moving forward, and it's otherwise you're going to look like a deer in the headlights. So if you're in stasis, if you're static, if you're not moving, guaranteed your competitors are moving. And what is even a worse situation is when you don't even know who your competitors are. So all of this is the environment that we work in nowadays in business and in many other fields of endeavor. And this fog of war and this chaotic uh, marketplace that we're in leads to a need for offensive action. So what are some of the applications of offense? Well, you can use it in sales and business development. So for instance, you can reach out to customers and prospects, stay in contact, offer free value. So don't wait for them to come to you, you go to them. Internal processes and organizational change. Uh, don't wait for, need, for the need to change. You have to stay ahead of the curve. You can implement organizational change and make sure that it stays in action and that you're continually improving. So we talk about continuous improvement. That's part of the offensive mindset. Recruiting and succession management. Uh, you have to attract and retain talented individuals continually, even if you don't immediately know what you're going to be doing with them. I have a colleague, Roberta Matchison. She helps companies do just this. The next, whoa, what the heck happened there? Sorry about that. This is embarrassing. Okay. So investing, obviously, uh, be prepared for unforeseen events, take preventive and contingent measures to manage your risks. Uh, the next one we've got is public relations and crisis management. Treat your reputation and your brand as your most valuable asset. Be on the fence of be proactive. It's a bit of a hackneyed term, but it's true. You have to be active. You have to stay ahead of the curve. Risk management. You have to manage your risks actively through prevention and contingent measures amongst other things. Finally, leadership. You have to treat your people well. Don't assume that they're damaged and you have to leverage their intrinsic motivation rather than trying to always raise the bar higher through costly extrinsic motivators. And we know through research now that working through 
intrinsic motivation, motivating people internally is one of the best ways, it's pro is much better than just trying to use rewards and punishments. It's called transformational leadership. I've got a whole other thing I can do about that, but that's part of the offensive mindset. So you can apply offense to all of these. But and finally, fundraising. If you're in a if you're in a not-for-profit situation of some kind or a public agency, you can apply these principles to fundraising also. But our focus today is on competitive applications. So why do we need offense? Well, first of all, it's better for morale and motivation. And in as they say in sports and in the military, nothing is better for morale than being on the offensive and nothing even better is to be uh, winning. So what is morale? It's the willingness and motivation to make the sacrifices that are needed in order to win. So what do you need to do in order to win? That is what morale is. It's not mood. It's not, uh, you know, is everybody happy and, and all these kinds of superficial things. If you look over here, what's called hygiene factors, Hertzberg called those hygiene factors. These are extrinsic motivators. They show you that these factors are only external. They push people and they have their limits. If you really want to motivate people, it's going through purpose, challenge, satisfaction, good leadership, unity and cohesion. These are true intrinsic motivators. They provide recognition and responsibility. They're more enduring and that exercises a pull rather than a push on people. And the best way to get that is through offensive action. The next one is why do we need offense? Well, to provide freedom of action and freedom of maneuver. And, and here what, what I'm trying to show here with these slides is you have to balance decisions and your commitment to the freedom you're going to have. So every decision you make, it can limit your freedom of action, but it can also increase your freedom of action. And when you've got freedom of action, you can choose the time and place to go after your competitors. So assuming your competitor is here occupying a market position, so you can either go in a frontal attack, which is very costly, and I'll get to that in a second. Much better is to attack them, is to go at them in a flanking maneuver. So do something better than they're already doing. So go after one of their vulnerabilities or weaknesses. But even better than that is to bypass them completely, get completely around them. The example I've got here, of course, is the Apple iPhone went completely around the existing competitors. The smartphones that existed at that time, the best one was the, the BlackBerry, of course. But what the iPhone did was put the same kind of functionality into consumers' hands, which didn't really exist up to that point, and combined it with the same type of functionality as you had, say, in a Palm Pilot. So that's really what the innovative part of it was. So Apple was able to get completely bypassed around Research in Motion and other companies to offer a completely new product for a completely new market. And I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, before I continue also, I'd like to say that when you, your mission, your value proposition as a company, your vision and mission are one of the fundamental things that allow you to either limit your freedom of action or increase your freedom of action. One of the companies that has done very well over the decades in redefining themselves and giving themselves new freedom of action has been IBM. They've consistently redefined what they are as a company. They started out making punch card readers and now they're the largest software and one of the largest uh, software services companies in the world. And they're getting into cloud management and data management, knowledge management, very, very advanced areas of IT. The point is that by continuously reinventing itself and redefining, taking decisions that push the envelope, IBM has given itself maximum freedom of action. So, and finally, why offense? Well, it gives you better control of timing and location, and that gives you speed and surprise. So another example of that, once again, is Apple. Apple is the market leader. What does that do? It confers speed and surprise on Apple. So Apple gets to choose the timing and location for when it introduces new products and services. And the followers 
companies like Research in Motion, Microsoft, they have to telegraph their intentions a long time ahead of time. So that's certainly a disadvantage for them because competitors know what's happening. And the reason why they have to do that, telegraph their intentions, is to keep their loyalists, their loyal customers, aware of what's happening, that something's coming down the pipe that's going to satisfy one of these new needs that have been created by Apple. That, for instance, is why Research in Motion had to launch the playbook two years ago, mostly uh, prematurely, because they had to show their corporate clients and their institutional clients that they had a tablet product. And they, it was a defensive maneuver. They had no choice but to do that. Why? Because Apple was in the lead and was a, had introduced the iPad, and this created the need, and it created the want amongst their customers. Uh, another example, Huffington Post, whatever else you think about it, it started out as a blog, but now they're expanding. They want to expand to 15 countries within the next 18 months. They're already in Canada, I think in Britain and in Australia. And the existing news providers in most of those countries that they're going to be expanding into, they're, assign they're aligning themselves with Huffington Post. So they're creating joint ventures where Huffington Post will be providing content for these existing news providers. What this shows me is that Huffington Post is on the offensive and those companies that are feeling they have to team up with Huffington Post are on the defensive. So offense is important because it gives you control of timing and location for your actions and that confers speed and mostly surprise. Very important. So what does it mean for business? Well, it means you get to choose the best products and services and provide higher value services. It means to get you, you get to choose the best customers and segments. You can set higher prices. You can choose the time and place to act, which is what I was just talking about. This confers speed and surprise. And you can also choose which risks to accept and manage, which is critical. If you're continually reacting, you're not choosing the risks. So the risk reward ratio is a lot, is not in your favor. So companies that are in crisis management mode that are reacting to what competitors are doing and to what the market wants have many more risks and threats overhanging them. So if you're in the lead, you get to choose those risks and manage it much more actively. And that's a critical advantage. So here's a, once again, continuing the, with the comparison between Apple and Microsoft. And I'm using, you know, digital internet or a sort, of, sort of digital mobility, internet, mo mobile internet and accessibility to information and communications means as, as the example. Windows has been the main thrust for decades of Microsoft. And what that's allowed it to do is to dominate desktop computing, certainly through the 90s and even into the into the, the second decade of the 21st century. Apple, on the other hand, has not tried to make any kind of incursion or intentional incursion into that corporate and institutional market. In other words, they left that to Microsoft. What they went after was the consumer market. So first with the iMac in 1998, then the iPad, iTunes, iPhone, the App Store, and then the iPad. Now, things have slowed down a bit, and Apple is just into improving its products, the, uh, the Mac and the iPhone and iPad and iStore and uh, App Store and iTunes since then. So they've lost a bit of that impetus, but their main thrust at Apple has been to dominate mobile communications and entertainment. And in doing that, they've done what traditionally they used to call the naval strategy, crossing the T. So that means going, by going at right angles to Windows and to main Microsoft's main thrust, they effectively cut off Microsoft's ability to take a lead in the consumer market. And the only real leadership position that Microsoft now has in the consumer market and arguably, and then even that is arguable, is with uh, the, the Xbox. And that's probably the, the core of where Microsoft can go in the future. So Microsoft was focused on corporate and institutional sales of productivity or software and various uh, enterprise applications and uh, uh, operating systems. And they're still very good at that and uh, very strong in that area. But Apple didn't try to conquer that for themselves, 
they went diagonally. They went, they crossed Microsoft's T. And we can even say that Research in Motion did the same thing with, uh, with Windows. Research in Motion didn't try to go after the, the desktop computing and enterprise software market. They created the BlackBerry, which was another way to go and cross Microsoft's T. So we also talk about, we're, we're talking a lot about high tech companies. Uh, Christensen, Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, said that, you know, this applies to any industry. He showed how uh, this same type of dynamic has also applied historically to, say, steam shovels and excavators. So it applies to any industry. Uh, and if you take, for instance, newspapers, they've had a hard time adjusting to radio and TV, much less the internet. Now they're dying because Google came out of nowhere as a competitor uh, to redefine the needs of advertisers. So, and because media, what they do is they aggregate and then sell audiences to advertisers. It turned out that Google was able to do that much more efficiently, at least for one segment. It completely undercut uh, the local advertising market for newspapers. So now what we've got is you're either a very large national or international brand newspaper, the Globe and Mail in Canada, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, Washington Post in the States, uh, or newspaper, local newspapers are just like local advertisers now. But even there, uh, they're very, very weak compared to uh, what can be done on the internet. So what I'd like to do now is go to the next section, which is about assessing the offensive capability. And here we're already getting, getting into the meat of the issue. And I'm not talking too much about offensive action from a military standpoint. You can get that in my book, Brilliant Maneuvers. But what I'm trying to do here is convert this into competitive dimensions for competitive strategy. So we've got the customer, we've got price, product, time and location. In other words, speed and surprise and brand. And this is new IP that I'm introducing today, new intellectual property. And what, a, what this is meant to be is a way to assess your offensive posture, but also the offensive posture of your competitors. And I'll be refining this over the next couple of weeks and months, but this is a starting point for creating uh, an assessment or an offensive posture index for your company and your competitors. So it depends on many factors, the industry, the markets, products and services, your product cycle, your customers. So from a customer perspective, what you want to be doing is picking and choosing your customers as opposed to taking what you can get. You want to set the price and you want to be working with early adopters rather than letting the market set the price or letting your competitors set the price and going after late adopters or people who only are, are interested in low prices. So competing on price instead of competing on value. In terms of product leadership, you want to be identifying or creating new needs, creating differentiated products and services as opposed to generic products and dealing with commoditized products. In terms of brand strength, you want a strong and admired brand. You want to be a trendsetter. One of the things we've discovered is that strong brands, consumers are very loyal. They're very, uh, they can be even obsessed with their brand and they will readily give up. They will readily concede or forgive that company for its mistakes. We've seen that with Apple with its mistakes, but just yesterday, I'm here in Montreal, the Montreal Canadiens had a free uh, uh, intra-team uh, game, uh, exhibition game, and it was free uh, attendance, and it was first come, first serve. There were people uh, waiting to get in at six o'clock in the morning. So that just shows the kind of admiration and the kind of loyalty that some companies can have. And of course, uh, opposed to that, you can be a non-entity, just a generic identity. And then finally, the surprise and speed factor. You want to constantly be surprising your competitors and dominating the market, as opposed to constantly being surprised and managing by crisis. So this factor here is very critical. And in military terms, in military strategy, this is called operational tempo. You want to be setting the operational tempo on the strategic tempo in your market. So what I've got here, this big oval here, is meant to show where you want to be. 
And the rankings up here, if you're in the middle, zero, that means you're in the middle of the pack. Minus one means you're a follower. Minus two means you're the last or you're far behind your competitors. In terms of on the positive side being offensive, plus one is ahead of the pack and plus two means you're one of the leaders or the leader. So obviously if you create a whole new market, if you create a whole new domain, you get to be the leader in that domain. And that's really what an offensive posture, an offensive strategy are about. So you can use this, like I said, to assess your competitors and yourself. So let's just use a very quick example here, Apple versus Microsoft in mobile technology. We could argue that, you know, uh, Apple gets to choose its customers. Uh, they have a fair amount of price uh, flexibility. It's less than they used to. When they first started with the uh, iPhone and the iPad, we could argue they were up at a plus two. But now I think they're down at a plus one. In terms of innovation and differentiated products and services, yeah, initially they were here at a plus two. Now they're probably around a plus one. In terms of brand, I think they're still the number one brand in consumer products. And in terms of surprise factor and speed factor and setting the, the strategic and competitive tempo in that market, there's no doubt that they're, they're here completely on the right. Now, in terms of Microsoft and mobile technology, I think they're in the position of taking whatever they can get for customers. Price flexibility, they're probably about average. Product leadership, they've got good products. They're in the middle. Now, I think that might be changing with uh, the new Surface tablet and Windows 8, and that remains to be seen, but that's where they are. In terms of their identity, their brand strength in mobile tech, I would say they're a follower. And in terms of their surprise and speed factor, there is no doubt that in mobile technology, they have been managing by crisis. They're constantly surprised and looking like a deer in the headlights. And as a matter of fact, they introduced, uh, it's in a related area, they introduced uh, Xbox Connect, which allows the Xbox system to detect movement, sort of like what the Wii does, but it just detects movements. So without some kind of extra device. And it took them a long time to really um, take advantage of the fact that there were a lot of people that wanted to develop new applications for that. Initially, they wanted to control everything. So I haven't been following that one very closely, but initially this, even the success of the Xbox Connect surprised them. I would think we can add the trends too. I would think there's a certain trend downward or towards the middle of the pack for Apple. That's discuss we could discuss that. But if I was in Apple, definitely I'd be worrying about these factors and where my positioning is on the offensive or defensive landscape. For Apple, I think they're getting a bit of momentum, certainly in terms of being able to pick and choose their customers. Their price flexibility might be going up their brand strength, and I think they're sort of getting out of this management by crisis mode. Now, in the desktop arena and in enterprise software, I don't think it's anywhere near this bad. They have a, they have a leadership position there. It's just not sexy. That's the problem for them. Now, let's look at another example. Here we've got Apple versus RIM versus Samsung, and I've got RIM in green here. Apple's the same as what I showed. I think Research in motion with the BlackBerry and Playbook has not been as bad as what everybody's making it out to be. I think they, they're they above average in, in terms of picking and choosing their customers. Uh, price flexibility, they're probably in the middle there in the average. Their products were on the way to becoming commodified, but the big strength, the big advantage that Research in Motion has is in the security and the fact that they've got a very secure system. So if they play that right, they can continue and bring it back towards the right here. Their brand, I think, is still fairly strong, as is the surprise, uh, no, sorry, the surprise and speed factor, however, they lost the operational tempo. They went into crisis management mode for about three or four years. And originally, if you recall, uh, Mike Lazaridis and uh, the other guy who's in charge of the company, his name escapes me, but they were pretty much in denial initially. They didn't see much competition or much of a threat in the iPhone. As a matter of fact, they, they mocked the iPhone. Well, that got them into crisis management mode. And now I think that they're coming back.
But even then, in other markets, like I was saying earlier, in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, they're nowhere near as badly off as they are in North America. So they've been on the defensive in North America, but they've been on the offense in many other uh, areas of the world. Now, orange here, we've got Samsung. The interesting thing is with Samsung, they have deliberately uh, taken a more low cost uh, approach. They've got the Android system with their cell phones. But the interesting thing here is, I think because of that, they are not as worried about the surprise factor. So they're not as much fighting on the ropes as research in motion has been. So this confers a certain amount of flexibility and gives them surprise and speed in terms of pricing. And even I was reading in the Wall Street Journal this morning, because of this pricing advantage and the fact that their phones aren't that, are pretty good uh, after all, the uh, Galaxy 4, which is going to be coming out probably this year, is becoming more and more anticipated. So this confers a certain advantage to them. So if you take, if you can accept your position here, you can still craft an offensive approach in other areas. And the surprise and speed factor is less critical for, uh, for uh, Samsung because of the pricing. Now, in terms of how do you actually maneuver how do you create offense here's where we're getting into it and we're the, the 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 key thing you need to know is you have to take the indirect approach in order to avoid your competitor's strengths so just like in military tactics you've got an enemy position here you can do a frontal assault as i showed a, a while back but your attacking force needs to be at least three times as big as the defending force and the enemy holds and fortifies the most favorable ground. So the attacker has to be at least three times stronger than the defender. The defender has the advantage of ground and fortification. So it's more deadly and risky to the attacker than to the defender. And the same thing applies in business. If you're trying to imitate, sorry, if you're trying to imitate a competitor, then it's going to cost you more in terms of product, time, money. The defender has the advantage and you're the one that's taking all the risk and there's really not a good chance that you're going to be able to overtake them. So we, we've seen many examples of that uh, over the years and I'll get into them in a bit more in a second here. So really what we're trying to do here is just as in the military, take the intro indirect approach. It's the same thing in business. What we're trying to do is get around the enemy's key position, avoid your competitor's strengths so that you can apply your own strengths in a new market or segment. So the aim is to disrupt, to dislocate, and to preempt. And this is also uh, some new intellectual property I'm bringing in. These are classical military concepts but it's the first time I'm talking about them in a business sense. So what is disruption? Well, it's preventing your competitors from doing what they want when they want. What is dislocating? It's forcing your competitor to react to your moves. So when Research in Motion rushed out the playbook in early 2010, I believe it was, and temporarily took the focus off of the BlackBerry upgrades, what they did is they were dislocated by uh, Apple's introduction of the iPad. And then finally, there's preemption in which you get there first and occupy new segments. So it's like that Civil War general, uh, Nathan Bedford, Bedford Forrest said, the idea is to get there the firstest with the mostest. But once you get there first, then you get to occupy the choice terrain, and that gives you a key advantage. That's preemption. So... What does that translate to in business? Well, you can focus on new segments or you can focus on product or cost leadership. So in terms of new segments, it's going after underserved or unserved markets and segments. So customers that aren't being served adequately or even at all. And in terms of product or cost leadership, you can choose to differentiate and have better products or new products or to be cheaper. Sorry, once again, I keep... And these are really the two key approaches to uh, strategy. The strategic dilemma, of course, is that companies, what you're trying to do is create a, 
a, a dilemma for your competitors. So your competitors are focused on their markets. So by being focused on their markets, that allows you the freedom to get around them and to go at a new market or create a new product or create cost leadership. So just some examples is Cirque du Soleil, a company that's going through a bit of a hard uh, a hard time right now. But originally Cirque du Soleil, what they did is they redefined what a circus is and they incorporated a lot more art, and music, and now there are many imitators, but there's still only one Cirque du Soleil brand. So by getting there first, they owned for many years, they owned this whole segment or market for artistic or artsy uh, and very performance oriented circus shows. Uh, Lululemon, another Canadian brand, they're based out in BC, they created a whole new product category for a market segment that didn't even exist uh, 15 or 20 years ago, which is yoga clothing for women. And they've got a very distinctive approach to that and a very distinctive approach to their stores and very loyal customers. And so they, they went after a market segment that didn't even exist. They created it and now they're number one in that segment and other companies are imitating them. Wikipedia. Uh, it's a not-for-profit, but it made Encyclopedia Britannica and Microsoft and Carta completely obsolete. And they did it with vo volunteers and a not-for-profit business model. Uh, the ability to for an established company to do this is much harder. And there have been many books on this. That's what uh, Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, is all about. The problem is, and this is the real strategic dilemma, which allows you to maneuver around these companies is that these companies are focused. They're doing all the right things with their existing clients. So by focusing on their existing clients, what is happening is they're losing the bubble. They're losing visibility on all these new possibilities. So that's where you as an upstart or as a competitor can look for these opportunities in the competitive landscape and go after them. So how do you generate offense with prudent risk? Well, you can have, you've got your current products and services and potentially new products and services. You've got your current customers and markets and your new customers and markets. So your existing business is your current products and services with your current customers. So you can offer new products to existing customers. You can offer existing products to new customers. Or you can take the riskiest approach, which is new products and services to new customers. So what you're trying to do is to reinforce your existing relationship with existing customers by offering new products and services to those customers. That is what, for instance, Apple has been able to do. It went from the Mac to the iPod to the iPhone to the, I, the App Store to iTunes to iPad, and then that has come back and it's a virtuous circle if we want. But then you can also offer existing products and services to new customers. So right now in Canada, the big buzz is Target. Uh, Target, uh, the American retailer, uh, the cheap chic uh, retailer in the States, is offering, uh, is implementing its business model and, and entering the Canadian market in a very big way. They're investing about three and a half billion dollars and they're going to start opening stores this year. The big thing here is they're not really reinventing their business model. They're modifying it a bit. So they're taking their current products and services and introducing them to a new market. And then, like I said, the riskiest proposal here is to introduce new products and services to new markets. And I'm not going to talk about this one today because I, I want to keep going here and cover the, the remaining ground I need to cover. So. As I said, uh, a company expanding into new market, uh, this is something I call the bridgehead principle. And it's another way to manage the risk while staying on the offensive. What you do is you establish an initial bridgehead. So in a way, this is what Target is doing in Canada. This is their first foreign expansion. So they're going to a market that is very similar to the American market and where there's not as much competition as the US. And they're hoping to make significant inroads into the Canadian market. Many years ago, about 20 years ago, Walmart did the same thing when they bought uh, the Woolco and Woolworth stores in Canada. That was how they penetrated the Canadian market. So 
Target is doing the same thing, and many American companies do this. And then they're going to push out once they become successful, and they'll probably expand into other countries, applying the same business model and the same expansion model. So what they're doing is they're on the offensive. They're going from the known to the unknown, but they're doing it very prudently. But there are many other companies that have done this. TD Bank, Toronto Dominion Bank, which is a Canadian bank, has expanded successfully over about the last 20 or 25 years in the United States by going step by step. They started by buying a small bank in uh, Maine and then another bank in Maine, and then they expanded to New England and then to the entire eastern seaboard. But they did it in steps. Contrary to other Canadian companies, like, for instance, jean Coutu Pharmacies, which are very big here in Quebec, but they tried to buy, they bought Rite Aid in the States, which was the number three uh, pharmacy chain in the States. But once they had invested in Rite Aid, they had shot their load. They didn't have the capital to bring it into a truly competitive position. And the, uh, the incumbents, uh, particularly Walgreen, who's the number one pharmacy chain in the United States, was able to counterattack and to basically chase uh, Jean Coutu back out of the Canadian, out of the American market. So there, there are many applications of this. And uh, I, I talk a bit more about this in the book in the context of logistics but it applies also into in the offensive mindset. The next point I'd like to discuss is the path of least resistance. And this is the obligatory Sun Tzu quote. And he compared military tactics to water. The idea is that water will get in anywhere and it follows the path of least resistance, as it's said in this, uh, in this quote. So here's an illustration. In battle, if you're going up against this objective and you've got a major obstacle here and you've got the enemy is deployed here, A, B, C, D, E, F. These are enemy positions and this is the front. You're advancing, but you're trying different ways of advancing. So you try, attacker one tries to advance here and gets stopped. Attacker two tries to advance here and gets stopped. Attacker three gets through here in the obstacle and then Attacker four follows through and reinforces and then reaches the objective. This is called probing attacks or probing. And the same principle applies in business where you need many innovations, many experiments in order to, you need to be trying many different things in order to see what's going to work. You can't know ahead of time everything that's going to work. So you need to have many experiments, many innovations on the go. And when you see one working, you need to have the forces in reserve and the resources to reinforce that success and break through into the new segment. So I actually have a, a client with whom I'm doing this. It's a small, it's a small company. And, once, and actually, I mentioned it before, they're in the event management uh, field, but we're working uh, together and working with the employees to make them much more innovative and to change the culture from a culture of tell me what to do to a culture of creativity and initiative and innovation. And in order for that to happen, they have to be trying many more different things. And the CEO has always had this attitude, uh, and he's the founder and, and principal shareholder of the company, but he's never been able to inculcate or get his employees to think in this way. And that's what we're working on now, is getting them trying many different things and reinforcing what is successful. That's called the probing approach. And what are the principles of probing? I'm going to go through them very quickly because we're getting to the end here of our time. But basically, you learn more by moving and trying things than by staying put. You have to pit your strengths against your competitors' weaknesses. And sometimes you have to find them first. And that's why you need to take an indirect approach, create or exploit the dilemmas for the competitors. We talked about that earlier. Advance on a wide front. So try many different experiments and innovations. Don't put all your eggs into one basket. So that's diversification. It's a variant on this one because you don't know what's going to work. People who tell you they know ahead of time what's going to work are, are lying. You need to reinforce success with backup forces. So you need to have those resources available or to find them in short order. And the way to do that is to divest from repeated failures or from business lines that are no longer growing or that are, are shrinking. You have to beware of complacency. So the biggest enemy of offensive action is to think that 
your competitors can't catch up to you. And one of the biggest problems, as we've seen with, say, Google and Wikipedia, is that competitors often come out of nowhere. People go, people say, where the heck did that come from? And that's really where complacently, complacency comes into play. And you have to be willing to exploit breakthroughs. So finally, creating a culture of offensive action. So this is one of my favorite pictures here. An off offensive action requires an offensive mindset. Why is that? Well, you need to be re realistic. How do you create that offensive mindset? Realism. You have to get your people understanding that challenges to growth are perpetual. So this is a succession of S curves. These are growth curves. And as we know, when you're when you're switching from one growth curve to another, from one S curve to another, there are risks. But you also have to realize that you're gonna you're gonna level off. At some point, you reach the law of diminishing returns. That means you have to take a risk and move to something new. And this is perpetual. First wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave, five wave, all the way up. So that's the first point is realism. The second one is people have to create a common understanding. In the military, this is called mission command. That means at the highest level, people have to, there has to be a vision, a mission, and a strategic plan for the company. But then people... This has to be communicated to each level of the organization, and people have to understand that. Okay, something's going on with, sorry about that, no. Okay, and then at the middle ranks of the company, at the operational level, the same thing has to happen. So people have to do what's called mission analysis, figure out how they fit into the bigger picture, the strategic picture. And then at the tactical level, they have to figure out how they fit into this picture. So I won't go into more detail on that, but that is uh, the best way to create common understanding and to make sure everybody in the organization is aligned to its vision and mission. The next point is relevance. Uh, this is a, two graphs from my book, but the point here is in the army, for instance, a battalion's area of influence, what they can directly influence in the battlefield, and then the battalion is within the brigade's area of influence. The brigade can influence things, but the brigade's area of influence is also the battalion commander's area of interest. And the division commander's area of influence is the brigade commander's area of interest. What's the difference? The area of influence is where you can actually make things happen and influence the outcome. The area of interest is what is of interest to you because it can have an impact on you or you can find out things that are of, of potentially impactful on that level. And the same thing happens in business where a business line's area of influence or sorry, a division, a division's area of influence would be the business line manager's area of interest and so on up the uh, up the hierarchy. And this is just translated to the actual responsibilities, and I call this empowerment. The business line manager here, business line B's area of influence, and he's got an area of interest which corresponds to his division VP's area of influence. He has to be interested in what she's able to influence. And this provides empowerment and gives the flexibility and the freedom of action to exercise initiative within the greater company's area of influence. So uh, I know that that might be a bit uh, difficult to seize at this point, but the point here is that empowerment is critical to achieving an offensive mindset. You need resolve. And resolve is morale, mood, cohesion, and unity. This is essential. Why? Because you are going to have problems. You're going to run into difficulties. Finally, the other principles for achieving an offensive mindset, the need to accept risk, the need to have standard decision processes, common systems, and predetermined routines. Why do you need this? So that you can move fast, so the decisions can be taken quickly. And people know what they're allowed to make a decision on and what they're not allowed to make a decision on. And then finally, contingency planning. That is what if planning, scenarios. What if this happens? What if we're wildly successful in this area? What if we're not as successful as we hoped for? And 
so basically, uh, that's what I wanted to cover today. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and unfortunately, I had to speed up a bit there towards the end. Uh, but the point here is that you can get much more information if you go to my website in the resources section. I've got, like I said, hundreds of articles, and there's dozens and of articles on the application of military wisdom to business strategy, business uh, organizational development, and business leadership. So, like I said, if you're, if you're interested in any of my comprehensive consulting services or leadership and executive coaching, speaking facilitation or training, remote advisory services, please feel free to contact me or if you know of anyone who can use those kinds of services. So in summary, what did we cover? We covered offense, what it is, why we need it. We looked at assessing your offensive capacity. I introduced some new, uh, a new tool, some new intellectual property, which is an assessment tool, a kind of offensive index that you can use on yourself, any part of your company, and on your competitors. We've looked at, the at how to maneuver and exploit weaknesses in your competitors to create breakthroughs. We've looked at the path of least resistance, how to create it, how to find it, and how to exploit it. And finally, we looked at how to create a culture of offensive action. So thanks for joining me today. It's exactly 60 minutes since we started. Uh, it was the first webinar of 2013. Hopefully, I'll be doing some more on other topics related to this, to applying military wisdom to win business battles. So we've looked at brilliant offensive strategies that you can use this year, 2013, and in future years. You'll have access to a download as soon as I can make it available. And I can also provide a copy of the, of the slides. Just send me a quick email if you want them. I've got five copies of my book to provide to the first five people who complete the, the very short survey at the end of this session. Feel free to contact me. My contact information is there whether it's for consulting, facilitation, coaching, speaking, or training. And if you know of anybody who can use those services, I would certainly be willing to take the referral. So thank you very much for joining me. Have a great year. Happy New Year belatedly. Have a great year. And may all your uh, offensive strategies be brilliant. Thank you very much.